Jim, I'm so excited that you are here today to talk about your great work, Salon of Mysteries. You have given me and everyone else here today the opportunity to see your work and see you. Jim Cambrone, and I'm taking a few minutes to talk about a painting I did in Sioux Falls between 1981 and 1982, entitled The Salon of Mysteries. This painting was um, commissioned by the Lafayette Lounge by the Frigo brothers, who were from France. They were trying to create a, like an upscale French restaurant, and what they wanted to do was to do a painting that went across the whole wall and underneath the painting there would be um, booths. So I worked um, for a couple of weeks trying to put together some ideas about what to do. My original idea was I thought I would make some kind of more contemporary, modern reference to some of Degas' dance studio paintings that he did in Paris. I had a meeting with the Frigos. They took a look at it and they said, ah, we don't like this. So I made, I think, about eight thumbnail sketches on the legal pad, showed them the sketches, and they pointed to one of them and said, we like this. I had a few kind of figures sketched in as gesture drawings to begin with, and so when I started the painting, um, it sort of took form as I went. So it's 21 feet long and seven feet high, so it's quite large. And because it was designed to go into this lounge, it was meant to be sort of seeing the bottom of the painting as sort of almost like your, you know, your upper chest or your neck level. So there are things that happen perspectively in the painting because it's so big, so you had to experience the painting kind of like um, it was designed to be like a trajectory or like a narrative line. If you look at the painting, uh, you'll see that um, it's divided up into porous sections. You know, there's the, the wall, the light, um, the opening, another wall, another opening, another wall, and a thing on the end. So this was a big challenge, and part of the reason I took on the commission was I always wanted to do something where I had multiple figures in the piece, working with kind of multiple points in time and perspective in the painting. One of the masters of that type of painting is the artist Edward Degas. He would draw from life, and he had about 50 drawings that he had in you know, a portfolio that he would use over and over and over again. So if you were to look at some of these drawings, you would see that uh, here's this drawing, and it's in this painting, but it might be behind three other people. And also, it drew upon this you know, fresco cycle from the Villa of Mysteries in Pompeii, updating that in, a, in my own way. And here, too, is a similar kind of thing. Parts of this painting are drawn from life. Parts of it are um, drawn from photographs that belong to me, some photographs that don't belong to me, and then sort of like concepts or ideas that are my own that run through it. I had to put it together like a sort of a Frankenstein idea, putting the different thing, pieces together. One of the key elements in the painting is if you have a painting that you can see all at once, you'll see a painting that when you're looking at it um, can be encompassed by your vision, either by standing back, or if it's a small painting, or by moving forward. So when you're looking at a flat surface, if you're way down at the end or you're looking at it obliquely, all of the perspectival lines will change naturally. So you'll see in the center of the painting, like a coffee table. 
and you'll notice that you can't see the coffee table's edges on their side. If you move with, uh, go up to one side or down to the other side, that table actually seems to, in your eyes, move with you. The perspective swings or hinges with you. So it's, it was a discovery that I made in the painting that I've used many times over the years is the idea of, of creating, in a sense, a hinge. It can be visual, like in this case, or it can be conceptual, some kind of conceptual hinge where something will turn and reorient itself as you move, not only with your body, but as your, your perception or your mind, as you're seeing a viewer, as you're seeing the work of art. I put this painting together, like the different various stages of a person. For example, the young woman, I believe she's holding um, a necklace that has a heart, but she's also standing next to a musical instrument, implying that, you know, she is wist wistfully thinking about the music, but also about love or tenderness. Then you go out to the outside and you have a waiter waiting on the couple or the woman, but also the man talking to the waiter. She's, she's the, the center. Then as you go across, you'll see then another figure, a young girl who has her doll. And so it's talking a little bit in that particular case about the importance of play and forming yourself, your imagination. And then you come to uh, the Rodin sculpture, which is the male figure in, as a bronze is being objectified instead of sort of the other way around. So right off of the next uh, opening is actually um, my aunt, who had passed away and I'd wanted to make a painting of her. So it was a way for me to make it more, make the painting more personal. As was most of the people in the painting were people that were either acquaintance of, acquaintances of mine or people that I knew. My aunt is writing, so it's like kind of thinking about um, a person's life as a writer or as a creator or as a painter. And you move to the next figure, it's a woman um, sleeping on the couch. She's in a sense of dreaming, or sleeping or dreaming. And then the small girl is looking in the mirror and for a sort of a, one kind of visual reflection, which in, comes into play in another part. You move over to the painting, and the painting on the wall of the dance studio is about a third of the painting that I originally designed for the painting for the Lafayette. Coming later is another figure, and she's actually the dancer in black, uh, the black leotard in the painting. But in this case, she has her regular clothes on, and she's holding the book of Sisyphus. In a sense, she's reflecting, and in sort of existential way, out the window where the young girl is looking sort of at her image in the mirror and maybe, you know, assessing herself or imagining the future. So all these different um, women play a part in different levels of, of uh, um, you know, their lives, their creative life, their imaginary life, their play, um, their thinking, their reflection, their dreaming. So like in the, you know, the Villa of Mysteries frescoes, which are sort of more about a ritual, this is more kind of an expression of uh, maybe the sum total of it is about one's, a woman's life in a sense. You'll also notice that some animals are in the picture. There's a cat playing with a ball of twine. And that particular cat happened to be my roommate, John Peter's cat, Bea, and she had many kittens and was also incredibly playful. 
The black cat on the bench belonged to my wife, and that was her black cat, which I never met. But I think the cat's name is Ray, and the cat was a female. And so you had sort of like this kind of little gender play with names there. And then over on the very far end, you, you have uh, the dachshund, and that happened to be the, a request of the, the patrons who made commission the painting. They wanted their dog in the painting. It was interesting to, and to think about where am I going to put it and how is it going to work with the, the overall narrative. And then there's the parrot, which kind of is like a mimic. And when you're making a figurative painting, in a way, you're sort of mimicking what you see. It's like something I really liked in some surrealist paintings uh, and other paintings where, in, in Shakespeare, which I really loved, Shakespeare might give you a play within a play. So in this particular case, I have a painting within a painting. So the painting of the parrot on the far left of the, of the painting is painted. And so the painting where it's supposed to end the scene is also painted, but it's, it feels like more real and because of that contrast between the, the two things. Part of um, this painting, the structure that partly holds together and drives the narrative is um, this kind of wave that moves through the whole painting. So it's done across from point to point rather than in a line. But if you look at the red parrot on the left of the painting, up to the red jacket on the waiter, down to the red strawberries, up to the red shirt on the woman on the balcony writing, to the red parrot, one of the dancers, and down to the red book. So it has this kind of like looping thing that moves through it that holds the whole thing together. As you can see in this painting we're talking about, is, is full of um, symbols and signs. And so I had a chance um, when I was at my, during my first semester of graduate school, I had an opportunity to study with three different people, and I had to choose one, Jacques Derrida, the French philosopher, and Umberto Eco, so an Italian scholar, um, was a kind of expert on the Middle Ages and Sebastian Chamyan. And Sebastian Chamyan was the person they chose. One of the things that I learned when I was with Chamyan is just uh, how signs and symbols work in a visual context. And so, of course, that was right up my alley. I was more attracted as a student in the European art. I was really interested in the rich iconography and symbolism. And one of the days I remember the most where sort of a bell went off is when Shamyan was talking about the language spoken by the Hopi. The Hopi expressed time through space in spatial ways. I liked that idea because it was more visual. So this painting was significant in developing some ideas about pulling things from all these different time periods and inserting them into an image or a picture. So if you're looking at this particular painting, what would happen if you had all of these different time periods mixed up? Things that were real, things that were imagined, things that, I mean, things that you did from life, things that were, you know, basically abstractions. If you're looking at this particular painting, there's things that are being drawn from all over the place. So you have an African mask, you have a, you know, a French sculpture, you have some French armchairs, you have some Persian carpets, you have um, the picture of Paris in the 1940s. On the horizon line, there's a mushroom cloud. All these different things together in the same sort of field or the same salon also thinking about the original sighting of this painting it was a bar. Just your engagement with the painting in the present has taken you across 600 years of time, and using my example, and there you are with it, and it comes to life. My teacher here at, um, August, at Augustana was Carl Grupp, and Carl Grupp's um, interest 
was allegory. At the time that I began studying, the first thing I learned was that um, painting was dead. And so that seemed like a real good start <laughs> to a career. And then I didn't know what that meant at the time. And I, of course, learned later. So what made this person that taught here at Augustana really special to this student was that he really believed in the immersion of a, a young art student in all of the arts. So poetry, music, film, painting, sculpture, and not from just one period, you know, he showed us things from every period showed us things that you might consider high art and some things that are, were low art or things that were not considered art at the time that have been considered art. We would, you know, look at those kinds of things in class. And uh, Carl was maybe one of the reasons that he spent as much time with me was that he knew that he had a receptive audience for what he was trying to teach, teach us. What Carl was doing was really out of time and place. And when Carl and I talked over the years, as I started to get to know him, oftentimes he would say that I was born in the wrong time. His work maybe wasn't as acknowledged as it might be if he had been working more in his own time. And he also taught me a few things about allegory that I think is simple and may be important to relay. When I first had Carl, he's always had eggs in his paintings or his prints. So what, you know, I would say to him, so what does the egg mean? Because I wanted the answers <laughs> right away, all the time. And Carl would say, well, I don't know what it means. And I was just, so I remember as a student being kind of incensed about this, you know. How could my teacher, whose work is about signs and symbols, not know what the egg means? And what, what is up with that? And a few years before Carl passed away, I asked him this question again about 30 years later. And I said, so Carl, do you know what the egg means? And he said, yes. And I said, so how did you figure it out? He said, I figured it out because in the way I was going about it was I guess kept putting the egg in different contexts. Kind of like a little child takes an object and at some point they're doing everything. They're tasting it, they're touching it, they're hearing how it sounds. And then at some point they take the object and they start holding it up and spinning around and holding it up against different views. And as you, all that information accumulates, you start to understand what that thing means. What he didn't know, I think, at the time was that he was working ahead of his time. Allegory and my learning about allegory has helped, I guess, with me teaching a variety of students who have worked this way. If you start to look at work that's being made today. And some of these artists who are quite well known are students of mine. For example, the artist Gahindi Wiley, who painted the, the presidential painting of Obama, was a student of mine. And you'll notice in that painting, some of the things that Carl is involved in in his painting. So you have this really dense background there's some little um, special things that are hidden in that background. The figure is isolated by that kind of uh, almost um, decorative kind of space. Is it wallpaper or is it real? And so those, those things were like sort of brought to life and connected, at least in this, <laughs> this student's mind. At some point in time, allegory was one of the ways that and people were interested in telling stories. And so all of a sudden, at some point in time, the principal way to carry a story switched from painting or drawing or prints or sculpture, installation, to um, film. 
What happened, you know, early in the 20th century was that a number of the artists tried to extend this and they did it in pretty interesting, innovative ways, such as Picasso's painting uh, Guernica. It's in black and white, and so oftentimes when you're reading about it, you'll hear the reference to the newspaper. But it also refers to the, the kind of um, newsreels that one would see in the theaters, in the black and white at that time. And so the Guernica painting, if you look at it, you'll notice that the proportion of the painting is the same proportion as a film screen. The idea that the narrative is being carried in this kind of format, it's like cinematic screen format, was one way that artists tried to extend the allegory. Picasso also used another format that he actually took from the Americans, which was a kind of cartoon format, panel to panel narratives, which kind of leads to the graphic novel, you know, those kinds of ideas of telling a story. Another way that um, that was done was through, Max Beckman was doing this through his late triptychs, where you would have a, a whole story and you'd move from one kind of section into another. And in some parts of the section, the paintings would not jive, and in other parts, they'd flow one into the other. So you'd have this more long, elongated format. So the idea of establishing a, a story on a narrative line, it allows, it's a progression. In other words, it's a movement or a trajectory. So like I was talking earlier in the painting, like this has, about this, that this painting has this kind of idea of a, a loop going through. And if you think about it, a loop, if you take it apart, it's kind of like a zigzag. When you have that tra narrative trajectory, it's a similar thing as a parade. They're like full of all kinds of disconnected things, but somehow they all connect together because of the trajectory holds the, the movement holds the thing in place, and so you can keep all of this diversity involved. Why am I proud about this painting? I, the reason that I'm, I don't know if proud is actually the, the right word, what I, I value this painting because as an artist, it, was a place where I saw really clearly who I was as an artist, and then it took me several years to recognize who that, what that really meant. From a perspective experience, I recognize it as a young work. An artist usually is thought of as, as having a vision and that your vision evolves over time this kind of idea of having um, multiple voices or multiple time periods or signatures within a single piece um, is you know, kind of explored and developed here. I was working out what kind of vehicle could I use to carry my vision forward. I'm very proud of that, that I discovered that in this piece and but the piece right before it and the Pettigrew painting of the dining room is really where I first really saw what, understood what the possibilities are. It's like no one thing actually overpowers the other. So everybody in the conversation sort of has a seat at the table and my own ego is sort of backgrounded uh, if I was to take my ego out, how could I do that? And in reality, you really can't. You can only do it by degree. So you know me, you see me in the painting by the choices that I make. Um, you'll know, even though something might look completely different, if you understand how I make choices, you'll see me in it. As Henry David Thoreau once said, it's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see.